Turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. I want you to write four prayer requests down. And please write these down and put them somewhere where you can get to them. Our ministry is flooded with four types of cases right now. Now, we had hundreds of different types, but, but these four are just inundating us. And it doesn't matter what state you live in, we're getting them from everywhere. The first challenge we're getting is all the new laws that want to keep us from spreading the gospel. And so we better pray that we keep in America the right to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, they don't care if you talk about Jesus. Don't say he's the only way to heaven. It amazes me when we go to Congress and speak with these senators and these congressmen and people elected officials in the state. They don't care about Jesus. That, that, that's fine. Just don't say that's the only way. Because, boy, do they take umbrage at that. And how many of you believe the scriptures are clear? He is the only way. Pray that we keep that viable in our nation. I never thought that I'd have the lawsuits that we're dealing with right now. And last night when he mentioned all those great men of gods from the past, you realize Jack Howes has never seen the America we're living in right now. Lee Robertson never saw it. It has changed that fast. And we need to pray that we keep the right to do the gospel. Number two, that we keep the right to train up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're getting inundated with calls from parents that are saying, they want to transition my child and we didn't even know about it. How can this be happening? And they want to do things to to violate the integrity of our child's gender. Boy, we've got a command of God to train up our child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's why I love this conference, the emphasis on young people. Number three, that we'll be able to publicly and privately pray. I never thought I'd hear prayer being denominated as hate speech. And even when they do prayers from the scripture that are in the Bible, they want to say that's hate speech. We've got to have that right. And then number four, put a big star by this one, that we have the right to live holy. Amen. Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's getting that plumb line straight. Boy, that helped me. He did. How many of you, that spoke to your heart? Yeah. Boy, I love America. But the hope of America is not the next election. I said that yesterday. The hope of America is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the hope of America and the local church. Boy, you're going to hear great preaching this week. Don Sisk is here. What a precious man of God my dear friend is, how God's used him around the globe. And then all the great preachers that are here, I salute you, I salute you. Twice in scripture, the Bible says that Jesus did something that ought to catch our attention. Twice in scripture, he commented on some people's faith. And he used a word that, that's hard to imagine. It said he marveled at it. The Son of God, who you can't fool, who knows everything, we can sure easily fool each other. But nobody here fools God. And by the way, we've all tried. How many of you ever gone to church pretending to have it better than you got it together? Hold your hand up, would you? Yeah. If you didn't hold your hand up, you can now, because you just fibbed, all right? So. 
I mean, we walk in pretending like our prayer life has just been stellar the last couple of days when it hasn't existed hardly at all. Or our time in the Word has just been absolutely fervent. And we haven't been in the Word much at all. We're good at acting. But we don't fool God. And God said, I'm going to marvel at something. Now catch this. Twice he uses that word in the New Testament. The first time it's used, he marveled at his own families and his own community's lack of faith. The Bible says he marveled at how little faith they had. And because of that, it said he could not do many mighty works there. Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Doesn't say it's difficult, doesn't say it's unlikely, it says it's impossible. So when he looked at their faith, he marveled and said, there's next to nothing here. But then he looked at a man, a centurion, and he said, I've not seen faith like that anywhere in Israel. And the Son of God marveled at the amount of his faith. One time he marveled at how little faith. The second time he marveled at how great a faith. Wow. Now, we could use the word marvel today. Boy, that's the word exactly in Scripture. But we'd probably be more prone to use the word wow. Wow, there's next to no faith there. Wow, is there a lot of faith there? And if the Lord were to walk these aisles in a form we could see, and, and if we said, show us which way we're wowing you, Jesus. I wonder how many of you would say, man, I can't wait for him to get to my row. <laughs> I want everybody to know what the Lord says about how much I have. Well, God tells us some things about this centurion. We get to heaven, I want to meet this man. Because he wowed Jesus with his faith. Chapter 7. Get ready to read with me the book of Luke, verse 1. And when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they brought him instantly, besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he is now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Therefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed." For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. Then Jesus heard these things. When Jesus heard these things, say out loud the next two words. He marveled. Wow. He marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you that I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. A centurion was somebody unbelievably powerful. A centurion was the occupying force that when they absolutely ravished the land, they put centurions in and they kept the people in line. Now, they didn't have to be nice to anybody because they were all powerful. 
they literally had the ability to kill at will. So if a centurion wanted to kill you, even if he had the wrong person, it didn't matter because they had absolute immunity for everything they did. And so here's a man that doesn't have to treat anybody nice. He's all powerful. He also had the power to take anything you own. And they did. Man, I want your house, get out, it's now mine. I want your family, I'm taking them. They were all powerful. And they were despised and they were hated. But this centurion, the Bible tells us about him. This centurion had the people he ruled over go to Jesus on his behalf and say, do this for him. He's different. I want you to write three keys down. Three keys to great faith. Boy, I want the Lord to marvel at our faith. Is there ever an hour America needs to see some men and women of faith? And these precious young people, they need to see men and women of faith. And all three are right here in the story. Here's the first key. This man was kind to people he didn't have to be kind to. He built them a synagogue. He built them a church. And he treated them with respect. They may not like the message, but don't give them cause to hate the messenger. This man was so kind that the people he ruled over stood up for him. Now the scripture says the greatest among you would be the servant of all. Wonder who the greatest person in this room is? The one thing I can assure you is it's not me. Because I know better servants in this room than I am by far. Doesn't say the greatest among you will be the platform queen says the greatest among you not have the biggest church said the greatest among you will be the servant of all yeah. servanthood is god's standard for greatness and this man served people he didn't have to serve he showed them kindness hmm amen amen i can remember growing up one day my dad came to me and he said, uh, I'm worried about you, David. I said, over what, dad? He said, you're selfish. He said, I don't ever see you offer to help people if there's not something in it for you. And he said, you're very manipulative. You can talk people into anything. And you're a little manipulator. And how many of you know kids are born being master manipulators? <laughs> that little baby, just as soon as she can talk, is going to wrap him around her finger. <laughs> what a precious child. And he says, it's time for you to learn to serve. I said, what do you have in mind? We're right in the middle of harvesting all our corn. And my family every year would put in five to 7,000, sometimes eight or 10,000 acres of corn. And here we are getting all this horn harvested up. And he said, our neighbor down the road, the Tates, he's dying, he's really sick. I said, I know that. And he's too sick to put out his corn. And I want you to go down and talk to Mrs. Tate and offer to serve them. I want you to do something for them, not looking for something in return. Do you understand? Servanthood is not favor swapping. I'll do something good for you, but don't you forget it. 
because now you owe me. That's favor swapping. When's the last time you said, God, give me somebody to serve where I get nothing back? Hmm. I want you to go down there and tell Mrs. Tate we'll put their corn out. And I said, whoa, 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 Dad, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, I, I know you love me, and I don't want to be selfish. That's a sin. But, Dad, we don't want to do the Tate's corn. My dad said, why is that? I said, well, number one, we're running day and night getting our corn out. Man, we, we ain't got time to mess with other people. We're working six days a week, 24 hours of the day, and we were. Man, battling weather, battling mechanical problems, all the things you got to do to get those crops out and back. I, I said, we got our own stuff to deal with. We ain't got time to mess with other people. He said, that's your problem. I said, well, I got another reason we don't want to do them. He said, what? I said, there's not a nastier, meaner woman on the planet <laughs> than Mrs. Tate. She's the devil's cousin, Dad. <laughs> All that woman does is cuss at us and shoot at our dogs. When our dogs chase their cats, man, she's out there with her shotguns going after our she is mean, mean, mean. I said, let's find somebody nice, nice, nice. <laughs> Have you ever said to God, give me somebody really nasty to serve? <laughs> oh, no, I don't want to do that. God will answer that prayer. <laughs> he'll send me another deacon. I don't know what he'll do. <laughs> I mean, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. My dad said, I picked the Tates for a reason, son. If you can't learn to serve, you're going nowhere with God. Nowhere. Well, we went down to the Tates. Knocked on their door, and here come Mrs. Tate. She opened the screen door. She didn't say hi. She opens the screen door and cusses me out, standing there. Blankety, blank, 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 blank. What do you want, little Gibbs? What do you want? Now, back then, everybody called me little Gibbs. And I know that's hard to imagine today. I told my dad, I said, you hear that? What do you want, little Gibbs? I don't want nothing. I'm out of here. You think I'm going to put up with your abuse? I'm going to put up with you cussing me out? Huh. What does it take to make you? You want me to help you? Well, you can at least be civil to me. Where'd you get that in the Bible? She said, what do you want? I said, I don't want anything. My dad wants to talk to you. <laughs> and my dad said, he said, no, no, tell her what you want to do. I said, Miss Tate, I know your husband's dying. Yes, that's right. And you're not getting your crop out. She said, that's right. I said, well, we'd like to help get your crop out. And my dad stopped me and he said, tell her it would be your privilege. Do you understand the privilege is in serving? 
people call us at the Christian Law Association all the time, Brother Charlie. And they say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I tell our staff, stop it, stop it, stop it. The privilege is us getting to serve you. That's the privilege. Tell her it would be a privilege for you to do it. And boy, the words are just caught right here. I said, my dad thinks I'm selfish. And I probably am. But my Bible says it would be our privilege to serve you. That's what your Bible says. She said, well, I, my equipment is not ready. My dad said, that's okay, we'll use ours and fix yours. And she said, I, I don't have money for the seed or the herbicide. My dad said, that's okay, I'll get it all in. My boy wants to serve you because he's a Christian. And she looked at me and she says, is that right? I said, well, yeah. <laughs> well, we went back, and my dad's staff that was working in the fields on all this corn stuff came up to me and said, do I hear right? We're going to help do theirs, too? And I said, yeah. And they said, we're doing it for the Tates? Little Gibbs, that guy, that lady hates you. <laughs> that, that woman is just mean. I said, yeah, I know, but my dad thinks that's the one I need. <laughs> and Earl Meeks, who was there, said, yeah, your dad's right. You would manipulate and get somebody nice, and then you'd have them doing everything for us. In fact, you'd get them in our crops and have them do our work. And I thought, man, that'd be good. <laughs> well, we got their crop out. And then we got it harvested. My dad sold the corn. And he said, now I want you to take the money to her and thank her for the privilege. Thank her for the privilege. Why did God tell us about this man? Why did he tell us about his character in serving people he didn't have to serve? This man's worthy. He built us a temple. Jesus, you want to do that for this man. Wow. Took the money back to Miss Tate. And I said, here you go, Miss Tate. And she looked at me and she said, blankety blank, did you take any of it? And, and I shouldn't have done it, but it just flew out. <laughs> Listen, you got most of it, and be happy. <laughs> she looked at me, and she said, I know you guys are always inviting us to go to church, and we've never taken you up on it, but any chance we could go this Sunday with you? Good thing they went, because he got saved. <laughs> and in less than two weeks, he was in eternity. At my wedding, Mrs. Tate was there. And she said, I'm so glad your dad taught you to serve, son. Our kids are watching. How many of you have children? Hold your hand up. How many of you know kids and grandchildren are God's little spies? 
They're watching. Wow. I'd come in the office. It was about 1.30 in the morning. My flight was late getting into town. And as I'm driving by the office, I see the lights on. And I thought, oh, somebody left the lights on. So I went in to turn them off. And as I walked down one hall and rounded the corner, I scared myself. On the carpet in front of me is my secretary, Shirley Block. And she's on her knees on the carpet at 1.30 in the morning. And I scared her. She yelped. I yelped. And I said, Shirley, what are you doing here? Oh, she said, Brother Gibbs, I'm so sorry you caught me. I said, I caught you doing what? She said, Brother Gibbs, when they clean the carpets, they miss all the edges. And these carpets belong to Jesus. Churches send money so we could have these carpets. And I come up here and I clean them. She's got a pail of water and some toothbrushes. And she's cleaning carpet edges. I said, Shirley, what time did you come to work today? She said, it's 7. I said, it's 1.30 in the morning. She said, Brother Gibbs, I love serving him. When's the last time you served and didn't want everybody to know about it? Now, can I tell you how I'd have done it? If I'm going to clean carpets, I want you to come with a camera. <laughs> because we chubby boys don't bend over that easy. And I want to make sure you tell everybody, you should have seen, I saw him cleaning carpets myself at 1.30 in the morning. I saw it. I got pictures. No, that's not servanthood. That's publicity. You want God to be marveled at your faith? He says, number one, you've got to be a servant. Write the second key down. And by the way, nobody can take your place. You say, my job's not to serve. My job is to organize all the servants. Jesus didn't say the organizer of the servants was the greatest. He said the servant is the greatest. Wow. Here's number two. You want Jesus to be awed at your faith? You got to be a servant. Number two, you got to be humble. Do you understand what he said? Jesus is on his way to heal the child, his servant. Lord, trouble not thyself, for I'm not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. He said, Jesus, I'm telling you right now, I'm not worthy you should come to me. And I'm sure not worthy that I should be able to come to you. Humility is commanded in Scripture. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Now, without exception, we're either humble or we're proud. And I'm afraid we've gotten really comfortable with being proud. And then we wonder why our faith isn't doing things. Can I remind you what it says in 1 Peter 5, 5? And what it says in the scriptures in James chapter 4, verse 6? It said, God resisteth the proud. If we, have pride, if we think we're something, we're going nowhere. People call me all the time and say, I just can't believe what's happening to us. It's like just this avalanche of trouble and problems and lawyers and and any advice you have, and I always say, 
Have you got any pride in your life? Because if you got pride in your life, you got God against you by command of Scripture. God resisteth the proud. Now, no one in his right mind wants to leave here with God against him. But the opposite of humility is pride. And boy, how the devil knows how to get us proud. To think I'm something, that you're something. We're sinners saved by grace. I've always loved the heart and spirit of this summit conference. Because in the praise, we humble ourselves. Wow. I've met some great men, but when I got to know them personally, they were loaded with pride. And then I've met some great men, and I've never seen more humility in my life. Would anybody around you say, what a humble woman? What a humble man? What a humble pastor? There is no such thing as being right with God. You're totally out of plumb if you're not humble. Humble yourself. Now, that's not a command. It's written in the continuum. That's not a command you do once. That's a command that you do and keep doing. One of the things that's helped me is my precious wife. Several times I'll have done something and I'll say, did, did you hear that message? And she'll say, yeah, I heard it. I said, well, what'd you think about? She said, well, that story you told. I was there, honey. How many of you all have ever embellished a story? <laughs> Hold your hand up if you've ever done that. Yeah, it's called lying. <laughs> but over time, we, we sort of remember some things and forget other things, and, and pretty soon the story gets a life of its own. And, And then we put little sub points in that I know that wasn't there, but it, was, it might have been there and I just missed it. <laughs> Humble yourself. The biggest problem I have in my life is David Gibbs. The biggest problem you have is you, my friend. Humbling yourself. Humbling Getting small. That's what the word literally means. Getting small. You want Jesus to comment on your faith, to be wowed by it, to marvel at it? Boy, first of all, you got to be a servant. Second of all, you got to be humble. And can I remind you, this man did this publicly. Everybody heard it. I am not worthy to even come to you. Mm. Write number three down. You got to be a servant. You got to humble yourself. And then comes the third point. You got to take Jesus at his word. I love what this man did. He said, listen, all you have to do is say it. Just say it. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come with thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. My faith's in what you say, Jesus. My faith is in what you say. Just say it. That's all I need. 
I mentioned Shirley Block. A man came to us one day and he said, why, why don't you folks uh, put something on the radio? You have all these lawsuits that come to you. Just put it out there. Now, this was decades ago now. And I said, well, we don't have any money for that. And he said, well, without money, you won't get hardly anybody because the stations charge. I wasn't aware of that. And he said, you may have a friend or two who will put you on to be kind, but you're going to have to come up with money. Well, Shirley Block was sitting there, and she turned to me and she said, stop it. Let's have God get the stations. She said, I'm asking God for 500 stations. And the expert who was sitting there saying, 500? If you got 500, you would be some kind of a player. Most of the big guys only have a couple hundred. 500, and he kept saying that word, you'd be a player, you'd be a player. And what makes you think you're going to get 500, lady? She said, my God, said, ask, and you shall receive. But you got to ask in faith, believing. And she said, I'm just taking God at his word. Now, this was my secretary, not me doing it. And I thought, oh, what a sweet thought. Well, the guy left, and Shirley came, and she said, Brother Gibbs, we're going to ask God for 500. And I said, Shirley, let's start out a little more. Let's ask God for five. She said, no. She said, you can ask God for five, but I'm going to ask for the 495 other ones. I said, I don't know. Take him at his word. You know what the centurion said? All you have to do is say it, and my servant will be healed. We've got that same Jesus. But you got to take him at his word. Now, you want to be a, a servant, and you want to be humble, and then you got to take him at his word. I can't explain how it happened, and I lived through it. Shirley started fasting and praying. And pretty soon we were on five, and then 10, and then 50, and then 100, and then 500, and finally 1,800. And people would come up all the time and say, how in the world did you do this? And I said, well, I don't know, just sheer genius on my part. I mean, I... <laughs> the only smart thing I did was hook up with Shirley Block. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you how it happened. David Gibbs didn't do it. The prayers of a secretary did it. My ministry wouldn't exist but for my wife's prayers. You got to be a servant. And you got to humble yourself. And then you got to ask. Just say it. Jesus, your own family. Oh, man. Their faith was so wobbly, so weak, so poor, I marveled at it. And because their faith was so poor, I couldn't do any great miracles there. I wonder what could happen here if we flip the marvel. But let me tell you about a centurion, a man who you don't know his name, but he was a great servant and a man who humbled himself publicly. And then he asked and just took me at his word. 
The answer for America is the gospel and the local church. And can I warn you, something's going to come in your life sometime, one way or another, where you're going to need a miracle, where you're going to need God. And the God we serve is just waiting for you to ask, to ask. Surely blocks in heaven now. And no one ever sings her praises. Because she was so humble. She'd never tell you her name if you didn't ask. But what a servant. What a humble heart. Scrubbing carpet edges. And asking. I'm asking God for 500, Brother Gibbs. And no, I, then I said, surely we're getting a few. She said, I know I'm, I'm raising my ask. Where would we be? if we could wow God with our faith. Faith moves the arm of the Almighty. Are you willing to serve? By the grace of God, are you willing to humble yourself? And by God's grace, will you take him at his word and ask? Bow your head.